different from my grandma who's a Stalo in many, many ways. She spoke Cree, she spoke Machif, and she spoke French, and she spoke English. She just had more languages than she could give you a hard time. <laughs> 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 you had to duck and dodge a little more. Did she speak the long, hard book? <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> My son See, calls it, don't way. look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all got that. <laughs> my, fa my father would totally control all of us, eight children, with a look, anywhere. Yeah, my dad does too. But when you say, <clears throat> when you say Trudeau. Yeah, I remember white paper, remember he said his the oh, yeah, here. That was, his family yeah. has Algonquin relatives. Yes. And you know why? He's kidding. He's it's just shame. related to me. <laughs> yeah, Grandma exactly. is a cardinal. Yeah. Yeah. And I met him in uh, 88 when the Museum of Civilization was open. <coughs> and we told him that. And after that, or, you know, shortly after that, he was very, very <coughs> I think, you know, it, yeah. Well, Sasha takes it more seriously, seriously than he was interested. Remember, he was introducing himself to all of our, yeah, to all of my cousins as, uh, yeah, as, as the other couple <laughs> here. <laughs> We're a nation We're that's nations. been invaded, and we, everything we're Indian isn't except the Indian. That's our reality today. But with the coming of the Europeans, you know, we weren't just sitting on this turtle island. <laughs> we had very, very uh, clear distinction. There's a word in my language, innesti. Because I study my language, when you hear that word, there's no translation for it. So I know my people made treaties way back yeah, with each other. and uh, you know like when we get together with other native people we start trying to find similarities like this guy what's the name of your book <laughs> so this is you guys this is what I find out at lunch okay? <laughs> the things that you find out <laughs> so the name the title of this uh, of this <laughs> new selected is called Kipochigan which like I said earlier Kipochigan meaning it's a slang word in Cree. It's taken from a word, probably I'm assuming a word 
kepaigan, which in Cree means an obstruction. So kepaigan, so kipo, kipo is like to shut something. Yeah. So kipochigan is to kind of like shut something down, to be silenced or mute. So that is the that's the title of the new selection. in my language means ten penises. <laughs>
with people. Even the district attorney came over to say goodbye to us. So it was such a wonderful way to recover, to have all these people interested in what you're doing. When I got to California, I never told anybody I was a published author because I just wanted to be there alone. Because a lot of the times when we say we're writers, people treat us differently. So when I got to California, the people that I met there never knew I was a writer till four days before I left. But being down there and going to uh, Capilano uh, College was really a way of rebuilding. But the other important thing that happened was I got to really see firsthand other nations, other Indian nations, and how they lived their lives and how they did things. Because us as Indians, we, we don't go to other Indian tribes to learn from them. Very seldom do we have exchange programs for our children to go to other Indian people. And I, I told my children, they said, well, let's go to Disneyland. I said, no, we're going to go to the Micmacs. They're, you know, we're going to find out about uh, <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> but we are um, all a nation of nations, and we had our trade routes. We weren't lost on Turtle Island. That's right. You know, Columbus was the guy that was lost. <laughs> <laughs> All the stuff he brought, he brought cats. My elder, you know, we have these wood boxes, we put dirt in them. Damn cat thought, thought it was a litter box. <laughs> and her elder so started, well, he was so mad, he was walking down the hall. Stopped and he turned around. That's another thing that Columbus did. <laughs> he brought those ten cats. <laughs> well, we're at a point where we've all been sitting here and laughing together and talking and sharing, and so it's time for the audience. And you know, you now know all these, people, these famous writers up here who are actually human beings. <laughs> Ask. Any questions that you would like, a burning question that anyone might have, or just a comment that you might have? Don't be shy, we're at home. <laughs> <laughs> so how's your mom? <laughs> Me? Yeah. How's your mom? My mom. Maria. Yeah. Good. Good. She's well. Oh, good. She is. It's been, been years since I've last seen her. Right. Yeah, no, she's, she's doing well. Um, Lee, you said something earlier, um, and I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a bit more. And you're talking about your writing, um, and you said there was a schizophrenic condition. That was my life. <laughs> She's been treated for it. I've been treated for it. I have the same place as well. Um, a lot of my short stories, I think, um, come out of the context of that schizophrenic condition. I love the medium of short stories. Um, those aren't the works that I committed to in terms of our articulating our original story, uh, the myth-making. So I make a difference between fiction and myth-making. Um, my, my fiction stories, the short stories, are, are uh, either from the point of looking at uh, other people, or from the point of, of being in, um, there's one called Puka Partners Uptown Indians and White Folks, which was actually turned into a, a movie in the U.S. I really love that story, but it sort of ends with uh, this guy that I kind of fashioned after an Okanagan guy. I don't know if you, you, you may guess who I'm talking about. But anyway, he looks at Roger's syrup. and We have a long history with Mrs. Rogers from Roger's syrup. Could get into that, but it's kind of gossipy. <laughs> hey, he's looking at Roger's syrup. He says, "You know, sister." Uh, and it, if the story is about the this office we had on Skid Row, and, and the big organizations took it over, and then they closed it down, and so then people had no place to go in the downtown east side. 
So she's sad. And she's mad, too. You know, I don't know if that goes. We're mad at our leadership. So it's a kind of modern political story about Aboriginal government puppets, really, and the community and the disconnect. But he looks at the sugar company and says, you know how it is. One day sugar, next day pain. <coughs> It. And that and that just sums up um, the whole business of my experience with Aboriginal organizations that are government funded. And so that's part of my schizophrenic condition. On the one hand, we all had good intentions. <coughs> I know those chiefs. They had good intentions. But you know, as we run around blind with pain, we, we do crazy things. And create, recreate the schizophrenic condition inside <coughs> our homes before we had one way of being in our communities and another, another world outside. But then I think around June 2nd, 1972, at about noon, we just imploded. <laughs> <laughs> and we started killing each other. I mean, literally, it was that dramatic for me. And my community participated in that. And I was talking to my aunt, for instance, Irene, and I said, don't you remember in the 70s that person blah, blah, She says, don't you remember the 70s it was a blur for me? And I realized that, yeah, I do now. Um, Jeanette Armstrong wrote a book called Slash. Uh, the Pandora House was my house. I had the only sober house in Vancouver that anybody knew from Ottawa and Montreal to Vancouver, down San Francisco, and people used to come from all over to visit. On the one hand, it was the greatest time in my life in terms of development. I met, you know, Willie Dunn, Red Bird, all these wonderful, Maria Campbell, all these people came to visit me. The chiefs, uh, uh, the Cree chiefs gave me drums. And, I mean, people indulged me. I was, all, I was 18 to 23 during that period, but it was also the loneliest time in my life because my family, I wasn't able to visit my family. I wanted to be a sober person. I belong to the long house, and I was the only one of my 23 siblings to return to the long house at that time. And it took almost uh, 20 years to restore my family to health, and I worked very hard at it, uh, on top of doing other things, raising children and so on. The other thing about the schizophrenic condition is my children endured it as well. They brought home their friends. They had about a dozen friends. They brought them into the house. I just ran into one of them not too long ago. I, I had, uh, anyway, I was serving fish and, and uh, cheese. You know, you put the, you put rice, then you put fish, and then you cover it in cheese, throw it in the oven, it's a meal. <laughs> I said, you got some real food? I said, what do you mean real food? Like, you know, like, Hamburgers with that real cheese, you know, it kind of comes in a little package. <laughs> I said, what the hell kind of Indian are you? This is fish. This is what we eat. And they all just took a step back and said, sorry, and they ate it. And they didn't like it very much, but they ate it. And when they left, my daughter says, they're all adopted. They've never eaten their own food. And I think about that. They've never eating their own food. We have a law called the law of stitch, the law of eating. It's a law that you're to be fed your stories. You're to be fed your knowledge. You're to be fed your oratory. You're to be fed the goodwill of everyone in the village. You're to be fed your spirit. You're to be fed food and without asking. So now we're coming back and some of us are coming back by universities which is why I don't like things like protocol. We're making our kids earn their names. What the hell is that all about? I was washed up when I was born. That's my name. I got another one when I turned two. I got another one when I turned 13, and I got another one when I turned 40, I think it was 45. We get several names in our life. This is my birthright. I didn't have to do anything for that first name. I remember saying that to my Uncle John, who's a residential school survivor. He's actually my great uncle. He's 98 years old, and he's holding up names. And I was the only person that he was willing to talk to. 
Anyway, I knock on his door. He says, get away from my fucking house. You know, he's a grumpy guy. <laughs> We're kind of grumpy. Solo, yeah. <laughs> Don't tell me old people, uh, old Indians are nice. I know better. <laughs> anyway, I said, Uncle John, open the door. And he says, is that you, sweetheart? <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, it is. My Aunt Irene's there. And he says, what you bring her for? And I says, this is your daughter. Smart. And of course, Irene just sat down in a chair and said, oh my God, she's talking bad to her, her great papa, yeah. And I said, you either give those names up or you hand it to somebody else. That's their birthright. This is our birthright. <coughs> Who told you that we had to earn the right to be? Well, it came from outside. It came from outside. And now it's inside. And we have to push it back out. So part of... Part of the novels that I write is the putting it back out. Taking the garbage out, that's what I call it. We take the trash out in our house. We take the trash out from this end, but we're not very willing to take the trash out from this end. You know, but we need to. So that's, that's the, I think, the stories. And we have stories like that. There's the story of Raven Song, the story of Blue Jay bucking the wind. I like that. That's, I think my, myself when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, all of these original stories are about times in our lives when we imploded and we had to take the trash out. <laughs> so I use those stories and put them in a modern context. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, so then you see your audience as trash cans? No. Oh. No. no, I see what's come into our community as trash. When we believe that our children don't have the right to be, that's a piece of trash. And it doesn't come from us. The daughter you mean is the right to be? Pardon? Is the right to be? The right to be is, is there because they're born. Yeah. The very moment they're born, yeah. they have a right to be. And that gives them culture, it gives them song, it gives them language, it gives them story, it gives them spirit, it gives them goodwill. They're entitled to all those things from birth. And when we bring in nonsense from the outside world that we're not good enough, <coughs> that our children aren't good enough, that's trash. Yeah. And I'm taking it out. <laughs> there are no trashy people, just trashy behaviors. So what is going to happen to uh, Aboriginal writing? One of, one of the comments that was asked, or one of the questions that was asked, I think it's a burning question is um, how do you feel as published writers about uh, mainstream and mainstream publications? There's a really good master's thesis coming out. We won't be calling it mainstream anymore. Okay. Uh, this lovely Canadian white girl has written a master's degree thesis on mainstream and Indians and everybody else. Oh, very good. Uh, we went through the, the main it's, street. It's getting thinner. That river's getting thin. Yeah. <coughs> Take a look around. Yeah. We well, have lots of people of color in this country now. so It, it always it puzzles me because in uh, 85, the visual artists, uh, you know, called the shot. They, they called everybody. Finally. They just said, okay, enough of this. They had the... Um, the uh, uh, get together in Lethbridge at the University of Lethbridge. It was called Swimming in the Mainstream. Yeah. And uh, we had, you know, you may know these people, Carl B. Bob Boyer, Eddie Pontra, myself, Jane Ash Pontra. <coughs> and we all sat up there and we just basically told everybody there were curators, directors, writers, anthropologists, ethnologists. Everybody came. It was like that auditorium there was just packed. Sorry. And we basically told them that um, we were in charge. And we weren't going to put up with it anymore. By the way, we had every right to show in ex uh, exhibitions in public galleries and spaces and just said, enough of this. And so I was wondering if that is, is has there ever been a movement like that with <laughs> Aboriginal writers? I mean, where, where you finally just sort of say, okay, enough. Because it seems like, I mean, this is a puzzle always in visual art too, because we have we have to show our work, so we have curators. And they're employed by the public institutions, etc., universities, historians, and stuff. 
But our own Aboriginal curatorial people, writers, historians, etc., are not getting the jobs. And I see that happening in terms of literature and writing as well, is that we have all these accomplished people. But they're, they're not getting the jobs at the universities. And so many young Aboriginal people are now going to the universities. And they tell me, a lot of them complain, I've heard it all over the years, is that they, they go to their classes, they don't have an Aboriginal teacher. They have someone who doesn't know anything about the culture, and they expect the student to be the teacher. Yeah, that's true. So, Eden so, House resident know. expert. <laughs> I remember them doing that to me too when I was at university. I'd say, you get paid for this, I don't. <laughs> Can you use your power as writers to change that? Well, I think the next power. piece of work I'm coming out with is the process of gatekeeping and uh, cultural equality. We're at least entitled to that. I mean, if they won't give us land equality, they ought to at least give us cultural equality. And there's no sense having two educations. There's more than one way to go. And our, and our students come to me <coughs> at University of Toronto, and they have to learn to write all over again because they're not learning it mm -hmm. from where they are. And so then I use a methodology that I know works for Aboriginal students because I've been doing this for a long time, since 1972. And it, it's, it's instant for them. And then they can manage the theory that they're wrestling with. They can manage the process because it is, they can use their, they realize they can use their own process. Um, but it, I think it's going to take a long time. I think we have to write things to them. From a theoretical perspective, I know nobody likes theory, but if you don't frame it, if you, if our ways work, they can be theorized. If our medicine works, it can be scienceized, if you will. We need to be able to explain how everything works from a very theoretical perspective. Otherwise, we can't. Our children can't earn a PhD. Do you see what I mean? Fight fire with fire. What, what, what I wanted to say uh, to, uh, to what, to uh, what Lee <laughs> said really quickly is that the way I perceive it is that by the time my work, by the time my poems or my books hit the university classroom, my thought is, is that my work is done. Um, my work is done insofar as telling the story. My work is done insofar as... Um, Whatever work I've had to do, whether that's spiritual work, emotional work, um, physical work, mental work, my work is done. So by the time it hits the classroom, um, <coughs> it's up to other people to do the work. I, I wish Lou, um, Lee was here right now because for me that's very much along the lines of what she's talking about, about taking the trash out. So my work is done. It's up to somebody else to sift through, if, if you want to call it trash or whatever, it's up to somebody else to sift through that. And the thing that's happened, even within this last 16 years of my career as a writer, is that what's happened is now, slowly but surely, we're getting our own PhD students happening in the universities. We're getting those PhD students who are pushing. They're pushing back. They're pushing the powers that be. They're trying to, they're trying to work within that system, but they're also pushing back. They're requiring our books. They're requiring that we come into their classrooms, that we talk about our stories firsthand. They're pushing, pushing, pushing. And what's happening slowly but surely is that our voices as writers is not only being heard, but it's starting this whole other discourse between yes. what the ab Aboriginal PhD students and, and what the, the students are, are putting out to the whole university, what, what they're basing their dissertations on, what they're basing their studies on, is, is it's becoming much more controlled. It's becoming much more a part of, of, um, of the way I see the fluidity of storytelling. So like I said, by the time my work hits the classroom, my work is done as a writer, as a singer, as a teller of that story. Then it might be that PhD student's job to pick it up and to do something else with it. I'm not a big subscriber. I don't, I don't read the theories on my work. I don't, uh, I don't like to have discourse about it. 
I don't like, uh, I, I very begrudgingly go into graduate studies class and talk about my work. I mean, I do it because I'm very proud and I'm very pleased to do that. But this whole kind of discourse about why I wrote something, <coughs> uh, 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 the layers to it or whatever, I, I don't want to know about that. Like I said, I did my work. So, um, that's what we call integration. <coughs> See, this is, this is something I think that probably BC experience and I think that uh, because colonization is older in the rest of Canada, um, maybe it, it was broken down, I don't know. But when I was small, Catalano was 98, Eshwolf uh, was 100, uh, Andy Paul was 86, and so on and so forth. These people that didn't go to Louis Miranda was you know, only 70. But anyway, most of these guys didn't go to residential school, and they would discuss something that was going on in the world, like South Africa, for instance. Segregation there and segregation here and the past laws in BC. I don't know how these guys knew about it, but they'd be discussing it in the language. And then someone would come up with a story, and then they would be discussing the story, but they would be discussing the story from a tremendously theoretical point of view. And what I learned the word was was tiniquit. And it's the way we it's the way we eat and digest mm -hmm. what we've swallowed. Mm -hmm. And then how we come to peace and recognition through all its layers and all its aspects and all its directions. And then we go back out to meet the world. That's how we see theory. And I know that I can right. do this. Right. And I can teach it. It's a different way than isolating dissecting, quarantining, right. identifying, and defining. It's I, mean, a I, don't think, I don't have anything against theory. I don't want to give that impression, but yeah. it's just that um, the theory comes from a you know, Western perspective. Yeah. And, and at what point you know, do we develop our own theory about our own mind? That is my theory. Well, I mean, what, black, you know? that is what, my what's theory. interesting? Which is my theory. I, I was going to say... Well, I think uh, it's always been there. It's just that we're trying to define ourselves because somebody's trying to define yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a pretty good idea of how, how we live our lives, what our protocols are, and how we do things. Like, you know, like for me, penis is not a dirty word because it's very natural in my language. You know, what's a bad, what's a, what's a bad word for me is somebody, somebody came to me and told me, that you have a real dog face. I'd be so insulted. But for me, if somebody told me, oh, you got a big button, I'd just laugh, you know. But, you know, because to me, those, those words, you know, it's, so natural in our, um, I always say that my grandmothers transferred all these whole things to me, but they also thought transferred talking risque to me because it's a very natural part of our, our, our way of living. And, you know, some, some places, you know, when I'm not thinking quite, I'll accidentally say something and all the big people around me, <laughs> oh, that Beverly, she's so shameless. <laughs> but, um, but this um, trying to to redefine ourselves after colonization is something our young people are going to have to do. Us, we don't have to because we got it by word of mouth from the elders. So. Um, there is a word in Cree that has the same principle as yours. In all pan, I can't think of it, but I know that it has to do with chewing the thoughts and swallowing them and regurgitating them. And um, in terms of developing our own theory, I think because of um, some of us who are the language speaker, it's encoded in the language, and, and somehow we have to bring that out, even though English bastardizes our language. Um, 
for example, and I cook it good, I use um, the word mystique that means eye to a lot of people, but it actually means the eye is a big heaven. So yes. the concept and the principle, the philosophy around the language is embedded in the language, and we have to bring that out somehow. So, yeah, I, you know, when people, for me, I'm just chuckling over the, um, uh, the idea of people theorize one word. I get a big chuckle out of it, and I, because my psychiatrist used to say to me, "Well, what do you think, Louise?" You know, so that's what I do to those academics. I said, it doesn't matter what I think, it's what you think. You know? It's not my problem at this point. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's already, in terms of uh, critic, uh, critical analysis, it's, it has been happening. Lee's one of the four runners here in terms of Aboriginal literature in the States. There's Gerald Bisner, who's been writing for years. There's now that Aboriginal critics circle. They just published an anthology. Shantitan. Exactly. And then there's Ar Aboriginal Literary Nationalism, which is a book that just came out. So it's yeah. happening now. And I think we're just opening up the space now. <coughs> is, it being, is, it, uh, is it starting to be part of the university curriculum? Is it, well, some of us are making slow. it. We're yeah, making some of us are making it. I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Yeah, we're we're pushing. Pushing. yeah and I wanted to say it's not. it's not quite as much of a dichotomy because there are there are Aboriginal professors who are doing theory as well and who are doing it I think as you're suggesting from their own and we to use the US perspective the from their own trauma. tribal perspective. Yeah. I know we don't use the tribal yeah. word here, but and that's one of the things that they're saying as you are that you need to to do it from your own yeah. nations. We, we have two tenured so, professors here yeah. at UC, I think. I think so, it's still two yeah. So there's a number of of authors and critics and professors in the United States who are who are writing in that way. And you mentioned a little bit this American literary nationalism and separatism book. Um, but a number of those who have their own works, like Robert Warrior and um, Craig Romack and um, Daniel just Justice, Daniel Justice, who's doing Cherokee work. So there are a number now. There's you know four or five who are doing a lot of important work and who are being picked up by others. And so. Um, I think that we can't totally make a distinction between theory and Aboriginal perspectives because there are Aboriginal authors who are using theory in their critical work. So, can I just oh, uh, what I what I find interesting too, just as a student of that, is that it's so because um, when you're learning or what I've been learning in the Western, it's so focused on like literature and the and the Text. And our theory is to a certain extent, but what I find so interesting is it it's, encompasses so much more than that, right? It encompasses yes. living in a good way. And that's embedded in the language. Yeah. And I, think, yeah. I think that when, when Louise tackles theory, it's going to be a very different book than Robert Warrior. Um, I like the American writers, but uh, Gerald Bisner says, you know, that it's all about the trickster. And yeah. Don't, don't no, no, I'm not. I'm not going with I'm what he's doing either. Don't tell. Don't start arguing with me. The other thing I heard from Tom King is we're about story and nothing else. And I said, well, you know, when I was having the baby, I didn't go look for the best storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Cherokees, but I went to a traditional. <laughs> you know, somebody who knew something about medicine and birth. I think what's happened to us is we have been uh, stripped. And it, it happened during the epidemics. In that first epidemic on the West Coast, which happened before white people even came, 1732, it came by the Indian trade routes. A million people died, the majority very old and very young. The only reason you transfer culture is, culture is because you have children. If you don't have children, and the teachers, the keepers of the knowledge, the very old, are dead, then a lot of things don't get transferred. They're finding out uh, through the aggregation of threads of, of culture that we have uh, 900 positions of knowledge keepers in my Stalo people. Now we've got maybe four or five. So we had a huge capacity for theory. We got an old story, you know, I'll just tell it to you. It's, it's comic, but there's a tremendous amount of science behind it. Jenny is that the woman at the bottom of the sea, which is how we get our thinking structure. 
when we came out of that clamshell, some men jumped on the shark. The shark took them to the whale. They ended up wandering around Skagit for a well, kind of lost day. Eh? But the women saw it too. They sitting there and they thought, well, we'll just go tell her, you know, a few stories. Maybe she can share some gossip and then we'll go up. So we go, we go over there and she says, where are you guys going? We say, well, we're going up to be people because we're still clams, right? <laughs> <laughs> the boys didn't know it though. Anyway, <laughs> she says, oh, here, take this with you. You might need it. And the woman grabbed it and it was brains. <laughs> and you know, they have proven that you get your brains from your mother. The only thing your father can do is dull your wit. <laughs> That's absolutely scientifically true. <laughs> and the Mayan archaeologist found out that the ove is not an egg at all. It's not a fried egg in there, ladies. It's a massive brain material. And what do we believe? That you have memory forever. That's what it is. And it gets dispersed throughout the body and into a little black dot, which is a methane neuron in every single cell. In every single cell, there is your forever memory. So when we invoke the ancestors, we're bringing that memory out, and we're bringing them with us. And we never have to do anything alone. And when we see something that we've written, then we know, oh, I didn't do that. But that's pretty good. I'm pretty yeah, thank you. I discuss you. <laughs> I'm going places now. <laughs> this is a way of knowing and understanding that science is only beginning to consider. It's only beginning to consider. But we had this. And we had a rational way of explaining it within the frameworks of our language. We had a way of entering, engaging each other in discourse around it. But those structures were destroyed when they removed the children. Putting them back together. I'll do. I'll do a jig. I promise. I will do a jig <laughs> the day that this is introduced in universities, yes. and the day that that is how our work is being theorized. I will do a jig. Because That's the children right. are coming That's here. That's right. They and are coming here. Finding what yeah. they yeah. need. And this is the privilege of time and space. Does I'd like to share a story with you um, that tells us about our science. Um, there was an old lady on our reserve, her name was Dwatsky. Um When the eagle landed on the moon, <laughs> his, uh, her daughter, one of my, uh, one of my elders, Adan, told her, uh, -uh there's a man walking around on the moon today. And this, this old lady said, Damas, oh, got my children, my poor children. They've made a hole in the womb covering of the earth. Said, you kids think we're just floating around, but there's a covering, Uyis, God. Yes. And now they made a hole in it to get to the moon. And my poor children won't know where their diseases come from. Our weather's going to all change. And so how did this old lady that never been educated, never, never went to school, know about the ozone? Yeah. You know, right now I'm teaching a, an environmental science class. And I've got this just fantastic niece that I'm teaching with. I helped her with her master's degree, giving her traditional knowledge. So she's taken, with a little bit of help from us, she's taken science apart and put Aboriginal knowledge, and she's now teaching it. I come in and I give her the words, and I give her stories from our culture that fit in with, with, is it called theory? Theory, yeah. Theory, <laughs> from the Greek woman. It's a woman! Yeah, so, <laughs> so she's, she's, things that we knew from the past, like how our people told, were able to tell the weather, 
you know, when the sun puts makeup on, we know there's going to be a weather disturbance. Yeah. When there's a, a circle around the sun, we look at it, see how big it is. If it's small, it's going to storm pretty quick. If it's a big circle, maybe seven days later, there'll be a storm, but there'll be a storm. And we watch the animals, how we, how they move along, you know. We don't say it's 25 degrees because European science didn't start till 500 years ago. Galileo, when he's... But we always knew that we traveled around the sun. The sun wasn't traveling around us. <laughs> and, and we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> yeah. And we had names for all the stars. I, I've told the story many times, and one of my people, they were asked, how long have the Indian people been on, been here? And the answer that was given was we've been here as long as the Pallades. We spoke with the Pallades. We called them the bunch stars. And they were little children that got insulted and they went up there. It wasn't until modern science, they got these telescopes and they could see far off that they found out there were seven stars up there. But our people knew there was seven stars because the little girl, she had her little brother on her back. And when you look at the Pallades, there's one star right on top of the other. There was an old Navajo lady, and her daughter worked for um, uh, NASA. And she came home and she told her uh, grandmother, we're going to shoot a guy to the moon. They're going to bring some moon rocks out. Her grandmother said, moon rock? You want to see moon rocks? Yeah. She went in her bedroom and she brought moon rocks out. How did you get those? Oh, we went up to the moon and we brought them home. And so she went back to work at NASA and, and they shot the, the spaceship up and and then a man got off on the moon, and there was her grandmother dancing behind that astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> and she could see this on the screen, and she was looking at the other people. But because we knew how to use quantum physics, we didn't use it as quantum. We didn't call it quantum physics. We called it Ikatusa. He's got power. Yes, that's what we And we about. knew how to use this power to go to the moon without an airplane, without a spaceship. You know, we have all these stories, and, and the Pueblo people have moon rocks that are very sacred to them. And so, you know, our science has been going on. You know, how did women learn that the brain of the animal can handle the hide? You know, we were directed straight, we were given these lessons straight from the Creator. There was no in-between. It came straight from the Creator. So, I didn't have to go through a Bible, I didn't have to go through books. My, my relatives just told me, my grandparents just told me the story. You know, they could communicate. When I was doing research on Vancouver Island among the Nechamath Nation, when Captain Cook first came, they thought it was their relatives coming back from across the ocean. And an old lady that could see dead people was sent out to look at these people. And she said, no, there, there's nobody dead on this, this boat. And then the chief went on the on Captain Cook's ship, and they thought they had the sun on there, they thought they were being fed bones, and they were being fed blood, and here it was the heart pack was the bone, the, the strawberry jam was the blood, <laughs> a little mirror was the sun, <laughs> and the humpback 
humpback salmon was this midget that had a humpback and they called him the humpback salmon. But we had, we were really closely associated with, I always say we had one leg in the spirit world and one more leg. So we got these messages directly. We didn't get them from anywhere else. So these, these beings that have gone before us didn't lie to us. And, and it's just getting, for a non-native person, it's just getting your head around that and saying, oh, books don't give me everything. Books have really lied to me because when you read your books, a lot of them are full of lies. That's true. And, and, and it's important to get the truth. Like the most important teachings that you can get are word of mouth because you're getting directly from the source. When you write a book, I'm a writer, I know it. I put my biases into, into my writings. So you can't even believe me fully. <laughs> you can't even believe anybody fully. I was once told by a writer, a well-known poet, that uh, the minute you put something down on paper, no matter if it's supposed to be non-fiction or not, but the minute that you put something down on paper, it becomes fiction. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, I, I was talking to this uh, uh, African Arawak Irishman from the Caribbean. I thought, what a combination. That's every indigenous person in the world, one person. But anyway, he reminded me that when he started grade one, he went to school in England. I thought, oh my god, I must have been to his class. You know how they hand you those two beads? You say, I'm going to take these two beads, he says. How many is left? And the boy looks at him and says, you can't fool me. There's two left. There's two. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same experience, but I realized that he's lying. And he wants me to imagine a void. Imagine nothing. And it's very hard to wrap ourselves around that, because there's never nothing. But he wants me to create this story of nothing. So I will. And then, you know, we have good memories, eh? I'm 14 years old and I'm sitting in science class. He says, nothing can ever disappear. I knew it! It's for freaking beans! <laughs> 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 lie of zero. There's no zero. Yeah? The everything and zero is the same thing. It's unimaginable. Yeah? And we're not using that knowledge for the same same purpose. I'm going to give you another example of um, how we've been shamed in my lifetime. You know, the whales came to visit us uh, in 1952 <coughs> or 4. I can't remember because I was very little. And uh, Dominic Charlie, who's uh, Casalama's brother, he knew their language. So he went out to talk to them. And he was very upset when he came back. And the white people asked him what's uh, going to happen. He says, well, the whales are going to commit suicide, and the salmon are going to commit suicide, and the, the earth is going to warm up. That's what they said. And the, the salmon have been committing suicide now for 15 years. Whales have been committing suicide since the mid-50s. And we are now experiencing climate change. And he was very upset about that. And of course, they made tons of fun of him in the paper. I had to go to school in the midst of this, you know, tremendous humiliation about, you know, making up stories that whales can talk and that they have a brain. Science used to believe that the person who had the biggest brain was the smartest, eh? Turns out that's, first of all, the killer whale in the Inuit. So then they said, well, that can't be true. <laughs> so then they decide to test this theory that the Navajo, Diné, have, that the more hues of color you can identify, the smarter you are. So they did a test, you know, they put in the 30,000 double hues of color that they know about, put it into a computer, they grabbed a thousand women and a thousand men, turns out, Women can identify on the average, doesn't matter what race they were, 16,000. 
one uh, Aboriginal woman identified 28,000 different hues of color. The average male can identify 1,600. So what was the conclusion? <laughs> Identifying hues of color has nothing to do with intelligence. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thanks for our panelists.